Good morning. Welcome to Trinity. We are glad that you are with us today for the ways that you put everything aside to come and be a part of us here in this place. Thank you for your commitment to worship God here today. Whether you are worshiping with us in person or on Facebook or in YouTube in the coming weeks, we are glad that you are using this time to worship God with us. I do have to give a technology uh, piece here. Sometimes our Facebook feed dies in the middle of the service, but please be well, uh, reassured that the whole service will be posted later if need be, a little later in the afternoon after we straighten out some of the technical difficulties. Friends, it's good to have you here. It's good to see all of your smiling faces. We invite you now to stand and greet those around you, especially those who are visiting. Our call to worship is found in the bulletin. Please follow with me. You who are many are transformed to become one in Christ.
Good morning. If you would please join me in the call to confession found in your bulletin. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, confident in this ever-gracious, never-failing help. We come before the Lord, confessing our sin and seeking forgiveness. Forgiving God, we confess that we are conformed to this world. We conform to this world's frantic pace, too hectic to notice all the blessings you provide. We conform to this world's reckless waste, exploiting what you entrust to our care. We conform to this world's shallow values, oblivious to the giftedness of people different from us. We conform to this world's impatient attitudes, preferring the latest instead of the lasting. Forgive our conformity and transform us, O oh God. We pray in the name of Jesus. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, we would now be lost in sin. But it is the Lord who is on our side, and so we are forgiven. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Thank you. You may be seated. And will our children please come forward for past ch children's time with Pastor Joseph. Jacob, come on. Come on over here, buddy. Oh, come on, Tate. You the man. Come on. You're walking with all purpose. Here we go, guy. Oh, you're going to sit there for me. All right. That's all right. I had to come out here so I could see you in the eyes. What have I got in my hand? Car keys? How do you know they got, how do you know these are my car keys? Because it's got this little thing on the end right here, right? And I can uh, unlock my door. I, I don't know if I could do it. I don't want to do it from here because I can't see. But uh, I can unlock my door and lock it. And there's, there's a panic button on there too. Now what is this? A key to what? A key to my truck. That's right. And I can unlock the door here. But you know what? I can all, if the battery is dead in my little fob, I can unlock the door with this. And you know what else I have on my key ring? I have a house key. Now, does your mom or dad have keys that are kind of like this? Do they have keys to their car? Some parents have lots of keys. I keep my other keys on another keychain. These are all the church keys that I have. And I, there's just too many to put on one, so I, I, I divide them out. Now, you have to, what happens when we turn, when we go to, we have to put the key, where do we put the key? We put the key in the ignition, and what happens then? We turn the key, and what happens? Does the engine turn on? Yeah? And what happens then? Do you get to go where you want to, where mom or dad want to drive? Yeah. And they may take you to get ice cream. They may take you to school. They may take you to the doctor. They may take you to one of your grandparents' houses. Our keys are important because they take us where we want to go. And they are keys to things that are important. Like our house key, or our car key, or our office key. And we have keys and we become Oh, responsible. That's a big word. Yes. 
you do have to have your license if you're going to drive. <laughs> That's another children's sermon. Today we're talking about keys. Thank you, Mary Pearl. Appreciate that. All right, so we have our keys, and we also have our license, and we go anywhere we want to go, right? But you have to be careful when you drive, right? You can't just go all over the place. You have to follow the rules of the road and to be responsible because you've got people in the back seat and passengers. You know what? God gives us keys as well. He gives us keys to live life well. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, you have to drive where the road is. That's right. That's one of the rules we have to follow. If we're going to go somewhere safely, we have to follow the rules of the road. God gives us keys as well. Keys that unlock happiness. Keys that unlock joy. Keys that help us uh, love other people. You have keys. You might not have a key to a car or a truck, but you can unlock a smile very easy because God has given you the keys to his heart by his love, okay? So let's have a word of prayer. Almighty and gracious God, I thank you for each one of these children. Bless them as they go from here to there. Bless their parents and grandparents and others who drive them. Help them to be safe in their car seat. Lord God, we thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much. All right, you'll go with Miss Christie in the back, okay? Thank you.
if we get any more people up here, we might need a traffic signal. <laughs> Thank you, choir. Uh, I'm, uh, we'll call on Worth in a little while to uh, make some introductions. But uh, thank you for that. I also want to, before we have our gospel lesson, I want to call your attention. Rachel is back with us after maternity leave. So we are glad to have you back. She takes her role as associate pastor for youth ministries. And so she will not only be working with the youth, but she will have uh, greater responsibilities during our worship service. Preaching once a month uh, next week is going to be a special thing because she gets to serve Holy Communion as her first practice as a licensed pastor, and we are happy about that. My friends, our scripture lesson for this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 16. We'll be reading verses... 13 through 20. Hear now the word of the Lord. I invite you to rise as you are able for the reading of the gospel. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, are one of the prophets. But Jesus said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. May God bless the reading, the hearing, and the understanding of this, the holy word of our Lord. Thank you. You may be seated. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly God, we are quick to identify who Jesus is. He is our Lord and Messiah, the Son of God. But help us, O oh God, in our lives to come to understand what that means for us and who we are. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We continue to make our way through the Gospel of Matthew. We'll be in Matthew off and on, well, mainly on through the end of November. But we're coming to the climax. Chapter 17 brings the transfiguration and, uh, where Jesus' uh, robes and face are all aglow. But right before chapter 17, here in this chapter 16 comes an important time in the life of Jesus and his disciples. It's here at Caesarea Philippi that Jesus begins to ask questions. Now Caesarea Philippi, think about the county seat. Think about all of the government that comes in a county seat. Caesarea Philippi is way up in the north of, on your map of the Holy Land. And so it's a seat of, of government. There are plenty of Roman uh, buildings there and places to pay, pay taxes. But it is also a place where there are lots of shrines to Greek and Roman gods. 
the gates of Hades, for instance. That's, that's a, a shrine to um, Pan, one of the Greek gods at the time. And so here is Jesus and the disciples in all of these competing areas, uh, things that are competing for the attention and the loyalty of the disciples and other people as well, like you and me. So this is where Jesus begins to ask the questions. Who do people say that I am? And of course the disciples chime in. Oh, you're this one, you're that one. But then he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, the apostle Peter, sometimes he gets it wrong. He gets it wrong more often than he gets it right. But this time, he gets it right. It is his famous confession. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, I'm beginning to wonder, if you read the rest of this chapter, does Peter even understand what he just said? Jesus says, well, the Lord revealed it to you. You didn't get this from anybody else. But perhaps his understanding wasn't there. Now, this is an important passage in the life of the history of the church. You will see church mentioned here. It's one, Matthew's one of the few Gospels that do that. And we understand this as one of the, the, the uh, origins of, of the church. It's an important passage for who... Uh, Peter will be, but you know what? It's not just Peter makes this confession. You and I make a confession. That's why many of us, most of us, I dare say, are sitting in this sanctuary this morning because you have made a confession just as surely as Peter did that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's who you say Jesus is. But the rest of this scripture becomes the so what? You proclaim Jesus as Lord and Savior, as Messiah. This is an important passage for all of us who claim Jesus is Lord. Because it not only tells us about who Jesus is, but it also answers the question about who we are. Since Jesus is Lord, who are we? And it also tells us who we are not. Who we are not. Now, we, we follow what Jesus says to Peter, and sometimes there's some very strong and popular misconceptions of Peter at this point. You've told a joke or heard a joke or if you've seen it on TV, uh, you know, where, the, where, the, where the, it, it begins like this. Uh, a man died and he went to the pearly gates and met Peter. In our popular misconceptions, Peter is at the door because you know why Peter holds the key to the kingdom. Of heaven, So he gets to decide whether you go in or go out or go somewhere else. But the thing is, with that misconception, we misunderstand what it means to say Jesus is Lord for our own lives. We follow it with these words that are, are, are continue in this gospel, you know, about, we think about the key to the heaven, and uh, then it goes on about binding and loosening. And I've always, honestly, have had a problem with this because it says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosen on earth will be loosened in heaven. And somehow that that doesn't just ring true because what it does is it makes us the ones that decide what happens in the kingdom of heaven. It makes us partners with God. It makes us shareholders with God. 
as if what we say down here goes up there. You see, the misconception is that somehow you and I are gatekeepers. We decide who goes in and who goes out to the kingdom of heaven. And that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is not talking about you having the single key to heaven and you getting to say who gets in and who gets out, what is bound here or what is loosened here. That doesn't follow if we, if we proclaim and confess that Jesus is the Lord, is the Messiah, the Son of God. And some of it, my friends, is, is this translation that we have. You, you have to understand that Jesus is speaking in Aramaic. Aramaic, uh, the number of people that were speaking Aramaic in that time would probably be no more than the people that live between here and Greenville. We're not talking about a big region. And then those words get recorded in second century Greek. Greek has all of these different tenses and participles and it's a difficult thing to hear and then it gets translated for us in the 21st century. But there's a better translation. A translation of what Jesus was actually saying in Aramaic at that time when he was talking to Peter and the disciples. And it goes like this, whatever you tie up on earth will have been tied up in heaven. In other words, it's tied up in heaven. It's bound in heaven before you do anything. You're just merely carrying out what God has already said to do. You're carrying on the mission. Whatever you untie on earth will have been untied in heaven. In other words, friend, we don't, friends, we don't tell God what to do. We follow God's lead. And we don't become gatekeepers. We become stewards. Stewards are like agents. We carry forward what Christ did and what Christ said. Now, think about a steward for a minute. The last time you were on an airplane... Um, gracious, if you've been on one lately, I feel for you. You probably got delayed once or twice. I've known people lately that are catching COVID on airlines. But anyway, you got stewards on those planes or stewardesses or stewards. And you know what their job is? They go down and they give you the, 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 the they are the, the representatives of the airline for you. Their job is to carry on in a way that protects you, make sure your seat belt is fastened and your tray table is up and your seat is in the upright and locked position. Making sure you have sodas or, what, or, or something, a snack to eat. They are the ones who are representatives of the airline. That's what a steward is. We learn a lot about stewards and stewardship in the Bible. Looking in the Old Testament, you see that with Joseph. Remember Joseph, the guy with the multicolored uh, dream coat? He was a steward when he got to go before the Pharaoh and say, this is what your dream means. It means you're going to have these years of plenty and then you're going to have famine. And the Pharaoh says... All right, you're, the, you're my steward. You're the number one guy. You decide how we are to get ready for this. In other words, he took the authority of the Pharaoh. It wasn't his, but he took the authority of the Pharaoh and made sure that people were safe and well-fed. You see it in the parable of the talents that Jesus said. There were these three... Uh, three um, slaves and, and the, uh, the landowner gave one five talents, which is a unit of money, another one three talents, and another one two. And what happens is 
The first two go and invest the money. And the third one goes and buries it. The first two invest and make it grow. And the third one is the one that doesn't. He locks it away. Buries it, as a matter of fact. So you and I, if we profess Jesus Christ is Lord and Messiah, means that we are stewards of everything in the kingdom of God. We're not gatekeepers. Now, the other part of this is, and, and I didn't realize this until I read it this week, is, is that uh, Jesus said, I give you the keys, plural. Not one, but many, to the kingdom of heaven. You have the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Do you remember your first car? what it was like to hold those keys in your hand and the freedom you had and the responsibility you had to drive on the road, as James said, and to drive with a license, as another one said. When you have keys, think about it this way. God has given us, we have responsibility for everything that God has given us our health, our wealth, any talents that we have, any abilities that we have in which we earn our money or do other things, play the, play the strings, we have talents. We have a will about how we're going to use things. Everything you have, you have a key to. And imagine it being locked in a room several rooms and you've got a hundred keys and you've got to decide how you are going to open that door to let other people understand and come to know the kingdom of God or how you will use your talents and abilities on the strings to make God to praise God now there are keys that we all have in common you know there are things you know, just because you own land and people can deer hunt on it, that, that's given to you. That's a responsibility given to you. God gave that to you. The environment we hold together, our society we hold together, our politics we hold together. We have the key in common. You have keys to the kingdom. Because you believe in Jesus Christ as, as Lord and Savior, God has given you keys. And with that comes great responsibility. And you get to decide. You hold the keys. You get to decide when to use those things, how to use them, when to unlock the door. Are you going to unlock the door to make disciples? Jesus Christ with your talents? Are you going to unlock the door of your riches and share your riches so that God, God will be proclaimed in other places? Will you unlock, unlock the doors of your hobbies? Rogers Greenwald gave me an envelope with a check in it. Rogers and, and Rhett Munn were playing golf this week. And there's a tournament that we have in town between members of different churches. Okay? Rogers and Rhett used their talents to play golf, won the tournament, and won $1,200, which comes to this church. It's the first time they've won it in a long, long time. But they unlocked their talents in a way that glorified God. You see, friends, we can be either gatekeepers and hold back, or we can be grateful stewards. But since we profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, my friends, we have a great privilege to unlock the doors of what God has given. 
The funny thing is, the more you take out of your storehouse, the more God puts in. This final verse, verse 20, always makes me pause. Why would Jesus tell them to be quiet? And here's the thing. Since Christ is our Lord and Savior, and we are good stewards, we don't have to say a word to make disciples. There is an order of nuns in Central or South America, and by their orders, by their vows, they are prohibited from standing in a pulpit and preaching or standing in a Sunday school room teaching, first of all, as their first mission. So you know what they do? They go around and they do acts of charity. They do acts of kindness. They take care of people on the street. They, they take care of those that are in the hospital that are terminal. They don't say anything about Jesus. They don't wear a cross around their neck. The only way that they could talk about Jesus is if somebody says, why in the world are you doing this? I like what you're doing. Why are you doing this? That's the only ways that they can say, I believe in Jesus Christ. That's when they preach. My friends, you don't need a bunch of fancy words to be a good steward. You could be silent, and by your actions, Jesus will be proclaimed. And finally, since Jesus is Lord and we are good stewards of the kingdom, we don't have to be anxious about the future of the church. I love this part where Jesus says, and not even the gates of Hades will prevail. What Jesus is saying is, is that when you're good stewards and you profess Christ as, as Lord and Savior, there will be no other idols, there will be no other circumstances, there will be no other political parties, there will be no other division that will threaten the church of God. We don't have to be anxious about the future, about the church. As long as we are doing the good stewardship that God has called us to do, you have a privilege, I have a privilege, about how we will be stewards for Jesus Christ. How are you living a life as a steward of the kingdom of heaven since Jesus Christ is your Lord? Is there enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian by your actions and by your stewardship? You have the opportunity to give. You have the opportunity to sing, to play, to participate in Bible studies also in the world. And it all starts because we answer the question that Jesus gave. Who do you say that I am? You're the Messiah, the Son of God. And because, O oh Lord, you are the Messiah, the Son of God, we are good stewards what you have given. How are you unlocking the doors, my friends, of what God has given you? Are you a gatekeeper? Keeping the keys in your pocket? Or are you a steward? Jesus is Lord. And we are good stewards in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a response to the word of God proclaimed among us, I invite you to stand and affirm your faith with me. It is the affirmation of faith that is found on page 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we, as the members and friends of Trinity United Methodist Church, also affirm what we believe about ourselves as good stewards because we just proclaim that faith that came before. And so in this question and response time, I ask you this first question. What is Trinity's mission? What is Trinity's vision? Why are we about the work to fulfill our mission and our vision? Thank you. You may be seated. We lost a saint this week. Many of you benefited from the ministry and the love of Janice Spann. She was a Bible teacher, a Sunday school teacher, disciple Bible study teacher, and an all-around good lady. We will celebrate her life and faithfulness at a worship service this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We will proclaim the gospel that she shared in her teaching and in her life. There are other concerns and joys in our world, and I invite you to spend a few quiet moments in reflection about your stewardship, about your life, and about what it means for you to say that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. As our instrumentalists play, I invite you to have a time of prayer for your own life. Let us pray. way, Lord, have thine own way. You are the potter, and we are the clay. Lord God, if we were to spend the rest of our lives listing your blessings offered to us, it would not be enough time. We're thankful for health. We're thankful for the material possessions that shower our lives. We're thankful for the ability to work. We're thankful for families. All of these things, O oh God, are a gift from you. We pray, O oh God, that we may be worthy stewards. Help us, dear Lord, as we seek to live in this world Sometimes it's hard because in anxious times we're 
tempted to turn inward, to stay behind locked doors, to keep what we've got as our own. Help us in these anxious moments of life. Help us to be faithful in it all. We pray, O oh Lord, for this world. We pray for the family of Janice Spann. We pray for others who are hurting and grieving and dying and lost. We're thankful that you are equipping this church to praise your name and make disciples in small and in very large ways. Lord God, thank you. Amen. For our moment of thanksgiving this morning, I'm not going to offer anything about the safety committee. I instead am going to call on our director of music ministries, Worth Llewellyn, to make a special introduction and presentation. Worth? Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing great. Uh, it is such a blessing to be here week to week with you, uh, worshiping through music. Um, Today, we wanted to uh, introduce a couple new members to our music team here. Uh, we've started a scholarship program through an amazing anonymous donation uh, to help grow our program, as well as give uh, students in high school and continuing in college a way to express their keys, uh, like Joseph was talking, through music. Um, we have Miss Ella joining on cello over here, and we also have Miss Emma, who is in our choir. Um, we are so thankful for these two musicians, and uh, they were supposed to start in September, but they wanted to start sharing their gifts a little earlier, and we were so thankful to have them. So if you see them, please make sure you give them a warm welcome, like I know you all are so capable of doing. Uh, and if you are interested in helping support this new ministry avenue, please see me uh, about supporting some of these scholarship positions. We'd be very, very thankful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Worth. We appreciate your efforts and energy in making our music program a blessing to so many. My friends, I'm going to invite our ushers to please come forward for the dedication of our tithes and offerings.
you now join in the prayer found in your bulletin. Almighty God, you took a baby from the Nile and used him to lead your people to the promised land. Take our offerings and use them for your people in this land and throughout your world. In his name we pray. Amen. Now let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Hear now these opportunities for service and worship in, the Lord, in our church and beyond. You'll notice in your bulletin an urgent appeal from Sumter United Ministries. Please take note of that so that we may help the need in that area. Our Wednesday night supper starts September 6th with a special kickoff, a chili dinner. We hope you'll be a part of that. The Fahola class is starting to pack the uh, meals that they do for uh, the soup kitchen this coming Saturday morning. If you can help with this, please see Max Jackson right after the service. Our final hymn this morning uh, is going to be, is found in your bulletin, and I don't have my hymnal here. Though. What's that final hymn? 117. 117. Thank you. You have given us the keys. Let our actions show good stewardship for you are our Lord and Savior. Go forth with the light of Christ. 